Grace Church, we're so glad you've chosen to worship with us here on this Lord's Day. And I will say to a few of you in here, happy Mother's Day to you. Uh, we want to honor our mothers amongst us, and at the same time, we are here to worship the risen Lord. And so we're so glad you have joined us to worship Jesus Christ together. To that end, I say to you confidently, He is risen. He is risen indeed, and that is the basis uh, and, and center and grounds of our hope. Take your bulletins if you have one. If you don't have one, now would be a great time to slip out the back door and grab one. You will need it. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, we will have our CE hour shortly after the morning service today, and uh, we are continuing in First Peter, but we're going to, as a good friend of mine says it, we're going to uh, stop and pause at a scenic overlook in the passage. So we'll, we'll take a little extra time before we move on. Next week, we'll move on to the next section here, Lord willing. Uh, but we do want to stop and give some focused attention to the idea of complementarianism and what it means in the church and in the home. So we'll do that today. Wednesday night is prayer meeting, 6.30 to 7.30. We'd love to have you join us to petition our great God at the throne of grace. He has invited us to be there, and we'd love to have you join us. Um, and then I've mentioned uh, briefly in the past a poten potential service opportunity uh, to help out our landlord. You've seen the rocks are on the sidewalk there. It's been delayed. The trees have been delayed. The irrigation has been delayed. I had a, another note from him here this morning. But uh, he's got someone who's finally coming Monday uh, to fix that up. And, but we don't know, I don't know if he's going to allow us to help him or not. So just watch your keyboards, okay? Uh, we've had a little further conversation there I can explain in the CE hour. So uh, look, that's it by way of announcements. And now, Brother Don, would you come up for our call to worship? Observing Mother's Day, I chose the verse in 2 Timothy, chapter 1, and verse 5. Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says this, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. As you go through this passage, you find that <clears throat> Timothy was a believer. He became a believer because of the... Um, testimony of his mother and grandmother and from there we find that a little few verses farther down he talks about that God encouraged him to fan the gift that God had given to him and you go a little farther into chapter 2 he, Timothy became an individual who was able to teach others also so these two women seem minor in, in one way but they were great in another let's pray Gracious Father, thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that we can just rejoice in the way you've uh, taught us and directed us. We thank you, Father, for these two women in Scripture that have had such a great uh, testimony and uh, <clears throat> developing a, a son and grandson for, for, for ministry. We ask, Father, now that you bless our service in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Don. Two women who would never be pastors of any church influenced Timothy, and hence we have 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, two-thirds of the pastoral epistles for which I am exceedingly thankful. Uh, you do not know the influence you will have, so whatever, to whatever role God has called you, be faithful in that role. And then I, I probably should mention, I, it's, it's been out in the email, but I found that there are people who don't have email still, and so I should probably announce, make this as well. Uh, rejoice with us. The Kurzman babies were born this last week, and so we are exceedingly excited for them, both of them. And uh, that came to me, so I think I can do this from memory here, because I'll pull up my phone. Um, what's the first one? I know Maeve is the second one. What's the first one? Hazel. Hazel and Maeve. Uh, we're born very healthy, very big, and uh, very happy for the Kurzmans. And so rejoice with us, uh, with them. Take your hymn books and uh, open to hymn number two for our opening hymn. 
Also, take your uh, bulletin. You have an insert. We have a few extra verses to sing here with hymn number two. The first three verses we'll sing out of the hymn book, and then the following four are in, are in your insert. So when you found it, stand with me, if you're able, and we'll sing all seven verses. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Let's sing. Uh, flip your sheet over and then turn to hymn number 106. Hymn number 106 is our next hymn, Let Us Love and Sing and Wonder. This is one of our former hymns of the month. Again, we'll sing verses 1 through 4 out of the hymnal. 5 and 6 are on the back of your, your sheet. Hymn number 106, Let Us Love and Sing and Wonder.
Thank you. You may be seated. At this point, we will wait upon our ushers for the morning offering. And uh, as our practice is, they'll hold on to the plates. You're welcome to put your offering there. If you're not comfortable with that, we do have an offering box out the back of the auditorium. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, you are the giver of all good things. You have given us life. You have sustained our lives to this point. And most of all, you have given us eternal life in your Son. Father, we praise you for your great kindness, your loving mercy, and your lavish provision for all of our needs. Father, we thank you that we can trust you. We do not know what tomorrow will bring, but we know that you will be sovereign over it all, working all things according to the counsel of your will, and working for the good of those who love you, who have been called according to your purpose. Father, thank you for this opportunity to give back to you not as repayment, not to merit any grace of our own, but simply with gratitude and humble worship for all of the good that you have done to us. We love you, we bless you, we praise you, and we give now uh, so that the name of Jesus Christ would be spread uh, throughout Otsego and the surrounding areas and around the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I should sit down and let her keep playing, don't you? Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. We're slowly working our way through parts of Scripture in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So we're looking this morning at Genesis 7. We are kind of in the middle or toward the end of Noah's preparation for the flood that's coming. And as as I read this, Please note that there's lots of little tiny details, and a lot of them are repeated just to make sure that all the things and pieces of the puzzle fit together. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you you are righteous before me 
in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of the earth, of all the earth. <clears throat> For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that was the Lord had commanded him. <clears throat> Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Of clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. On that very same day, <clears throat> Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to its kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, and every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was breath of life. And those that entered, male and female, of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Please turn to Matthew. Book of Matthew, we're looking at Matthew 6. Matthew 6, we'll be reading verses 1 through 18. I noted last week, and uh, do it again this week, we're, right, we're kind of in the middle of the, toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, we've gone through that, and there's little linkages of verses that hold things together. Through chapter 5, they use the phrase, you have heard that it was said, that kind of wording, he, he's hooking pieces together. He changes it a little bit when we get into the portion of reading this morning, and he, he uses the phrase, when you, when you give, when you fast, when you this. So there's, there's another linkage of things happening. And underneath those two linkages, there's another phrase starting clear back in, um, let me get my eye on it, chapter 5 and, uh, and verse uh, 21, partway through that, verse 22, it says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry, but he, he, the phrase, but I say to you, Jesus gives kind of a principle and says, but I say to you, gives a principle, but I say to you. And so that's, that, that kind of concept continues all the way through this, the linking lots of little neat things all together. All right, <clears throat> took part of pastor's sermon time. Now, chapter 6 and verse 1. <clears throat> Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, here's a phrase, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the, in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, a linkage words, they have received and their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. 
But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in, in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. <clears throat> and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your, heaven, <clears throat> your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head with, <clears throat> anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but that but by your Father who is in heaven, who, in, who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. May God bless His word, and may He bless our understanding of His word. Thank you, Brother Don. I uh, gladly, willfully, and intentionally give up some of my sermon time to you each week to do that, so don't apologize. There are great connections in God's Word that you won't see uh, when, as we're going through the book of John, because they're in Genesis, or they're in Matthew, or they're in 1 Samuel, etc., so I am, I'm happy to give a little time each week so that we cover all the rest of God's word. All right. Lots to chew on. Lots to chew on and consider. Let's take our hymnals now and turn to hymn number six. Hymn number six, the God of Abraham prays. And stand with me, if you're able, as we sing hymn number six, the God of Abraham prays.
may be seated. If you've shut your hymnals, that's okay, but if you haven't, look at the second verse, third line down. I all on earth forsake its wisdom, fame, and power. Uh, all of our neighbors, friends, enemies, coworkers, etc., are clinging to this world's wisdom, fame, and power. And Jesus calls us to forsake it, not so that we are empty-handed, but so that our hands are full of the best we can possibly have, which is stated in the next verse, same line, third line, third verse. I shall behold his face. I shall his power adore and sing the wonders of his grace forevermore. As, as Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. As Moses was described in the author of Hebrews, he forsook the treasures of the fleeting pleasures of the treasures of Egypt because he was looking to the reward. Christ is not asking you to give up pleasures. He's asking you to give up the fleeting kind. Take your hymn books and just turn over to hymn number three for our final hymn for the sermon. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. We'll sing all three verses here. Amen. Would you stand now, if you're able, for our scripture reading? The passage is John 16, verses 1 through 5, which is on page number 902, if you're using the Pew Bibles. The words of Jesus. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you ask, where are you going? But, I have, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world 
concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father. And you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but I cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The words of Christ. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we dive into his word. Gracious Father, you have spoken to us and we have heard your words. But we do not want to hear just with our ears. We hear so much that, as the saying goes, goes in one ear and out the other. This is not meaningless information. This is life-changing and life-giving. So help us to receive now your words as the words of, that they are, the words of God and not of men. Father, help me to proclaim your word clearly and boldly as I ought. Give each one of us ears to hear the truth, eyes to see its beauty, and the will to receive them and to respond appropriately. Father, we need your Holy Spirit to this task. We are inadequate. We are unable by ourselves. So we thank you for your Holy Spirit, and we ask him to do his great work in our hearts now for your glory and for our joy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What is one of the most difficult things that you have ever accomplished? Can you think of any? I assure you that no man in this room will begrudge you women, especially today, if you claim childbirth. But if not that, what was one of the more challenging tasks that you were ever given to do? Did it require knowledge on your part? Maybe even wisdom? Were there certain skills, certain disciplines that you needed in order to do the job well? And did you ever, in the process of doing this most difficult task, did you ever feel overwhelmed? Did you ever feel like you didn't have everything you needed to do the job? Of course you did. It wouldn't classify as the, in that difficult category if it, wasn't, if it didn't stretch you. Now think, when you accomplished the task, when you finished it, whether a degree or a skill set um, or a class or a semester or a project, were you a changed person? Did you come out different on the other side than before? Of course you did. But in those beginning moments, those fearful moments, those moments when you're not sure you could ever finish the task, those can be fearful times, can they not? When you feel overwhelmed? In our text today, Jesus is addressing his disciples at that moment of fear. He's told them that he's leaving, which they didn't want to hear. He's told them that they will have more persecution. Up to this point, Jesus has largely shielded it. The, the persecution, the attacks were focused at him and were driven at him. And very little, if any, was directed to the disciples. But he's leaving now. And they're going to bear the weight of the Pharisees and the Romans' persecution. Under, and he tells them this is all for their good. 
So understandably, their heads are spinning a little bit. How is this going to work out? So to help them, Jesus is going to continue his teaching. This is all Thursday night, chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 17. And he's going to explain to them more about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And in our text today, Jesus boils it down to this truth. You must trust the Holy Spirit as much as you trust Jesus. You must trust the Holy Spirit as you trust Jesus. And our text answers the question, why? Why should you trust him the same? And there are three reasons given. Number one, because he comforts the church. He comforts the church. Reason number two, he convicts transgressors. He convicts transgressors. And reason number three, he completes the Trinity. He completes the Trinity. And we'll look at these three reasons here in our text. But first and foremost, the Holy Spirit comforts the church. Jesus says, and we're in the middle of verse 4, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But, But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. As I said already, Jesus has directed, has absorbed, has drawn most of the criticism and hostility from the religious leaders here in Israel. But now he is going away, and he needs to prepare his disciples, and he's doing that. Christ left the apostles and his church in the world. He did not take them with him. Could he have? Of course he could have, but his perfect plan was to leave the church, starting with the apostles, behind. So he comforts the church, first of all, concerning his absence. And he assures them, my leaving is so that the helper or the comforter can come. Christ left in order to send the Spirit to the church. Now, He did not leave so the Spirit could indwell the church. He's already doing that. The Holy Spirit has indwelt all believers of all times. That's how he sanctifies us. But he did leave in order that the church could experience the baptism of the Spirit. What's the difference, you ask, between indwelling and baptism? The indwelling leads to all the work of salvation. Your regeneration, being born again, being hearing the gospel, receiving it, justification, sanctification, the progressive work to make you and I more like Jesus Christ. That's the work of the Spirit. Ultimate glorification is brought about by the Spirit. Okay? Every part of our salvation is brought and worked out by the Spirit in time and space in our lives. Baptism of the Spirit puts you into the body of Christ, which is different than Israel. And baptism enables you for service. The baptism of the Spirit I'm referring to. In the Old Testament, only a select few were anointed by the Holy Spirit. Okay, you see this in the phrase, the Spirit of Yahweh, the Spirit of the Lord came upon fill in the blank. Okay, we call this the theocratic anointing. It was for those who were, who were leading, they were in a position of leadership. And it didn't necessarily come on all who believed in Yahweh. And it didn't necessarily come when they were at the temple or at the tabernacle uh, worshiping Yahweh. It didn't come on the most savoriest or holiest of characters. King Saul had this upon him. Uh, He prophesied by the spirit of Yahweh. He uh, led Israel's armies to victory in glorious fashion. And then because of his disobedience, hard-heartedness, the spirit of Yahweh, the anointing that was pulled away from him. Um, and we see the effects of that the remainder of his life, okay? But 
So this is not talking about the regular, normal indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is why David prayed in Psalm 51, take not your Holy Spirit from me. He's not saying, Lord, don't let me lose the Holy Spirit within me, okay? That's the Spirit stays, the Spirit sanctifies, the Spirit works. But he watched the theocratic anointing of the Spirit be taken away from his predecessor, okay? But this enables uh, these, these men for service. So you look throughout the book of Judges, uh, Gideon is a coward. He's hiding. He, he doesn't wants nothing to do with it. He's asking for a gazillion signs, right? And then the spirit of Yahweh comes upon him, and he leads them into battle <clears throat> and does mightily. So we're not talking about that. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes upon every Christian in the church age and enables us for service. The Holy Spirit is going to come. He's not going to come and go as he did in the Old Testament. It's not going to happen just to the leaders. Every believer is equipped for service and is equipped by none other than God himself. It is to your advantage that I go away. So he comforts them concerning Christ's absence. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He also comforts the church with his presence. He is with every believer. In verse 7, look at verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. This is a promise from Christ. He will send the Spirit. Every one of you, if you are saved, you've been baptized into the church by the Holy Spirit. This is why we do baptisms, to show the church externally, visibly, what has happened invisibly, internally. And you are equipped for service. This was different from the earthly ministry of Christ. The Spirit will be with every believer in a way that the incarnate Christ could not. Now, this is not a deficiency in Jesus. I'm not talking about Jesus' weakness. It's just a part of his willing humiliation. By taking on a human body, he took on limitation. When Jesus was with the woman at the well in Samaria, he was not with the lame man in Jerusalem. Um, And again, this is not a deficiency. This is the reality of the incarnation. But the Holy Spirit, not being located in a physical body, is with all believers at all times. But... The death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus signify that an even better dispensation is about to begin. The age of the Spirit in which he will be with every believer in a way that he was not in previous dispensations. This is good news. This is comfort. Christians, you always have the Holy Spirit with you who always is enabling you to serve him. Okay? Do not think ever in any situation that you lack the spiritual resources to serve Christ. You may lack some knowledge, okay? I'm not saying that once you have the Holy Spirit, you know this inside out, you have it memorized, you can perfectly recall it at every point. No, but you have every resource that you need in order to serve and obey Jesus Christ, to tell the world of the salvation that is found in him, to disciple and encourage and strengthen the church to do the task to which he has called you. This is the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Thus, the first reason that you must trust the Holy Spirit as you trust Jesus is that he comforts the church. The second reason is that he convicts transgressors. He convicts transgressors. Look at verse 8. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, the world can have a variety of definitions in the book of John, but most prominently, most prominently, the world refers to the negative world system of unbelief. Okay? It's referred in a negative way of the world that is hostile to the work of God. And that's what he is referencing here. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. 
So look, first of all, he convicts of their sin. He convicts the world of their sin. Verse 9, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. This is not saying that the only sin is not believing in Jesus, but it is the chief sin, unbelief. To look at the Son of God who came to earth and revealed himself to us so that we could know him and see him to to disbelieve in him is the highest form of rebellion. The world has not believed in Christ, believed his message, and therefore uh, they are guilty. Jesus has spoken. He has revealed himself, made himself known. He made sure that his record was written down and preserved. And so the world is without excuse. Now, mind you, the world is without excuse without God's word written down, right? Creation is there. Creation is not the same amount of revelation as Scripture, but it is sufficient to condemn. Not only that, God's written his law on the hearts of men and given us a conscience. But even more so, he has given us his word which reveals the Son. Paul says in Romans 14, whatever is not of faith is sin. And so even the person who does good things, who does good deeds, because it's, it's just good, if it's not done in faith to Jesus Christ, it's sin. Now remember, brothers and sisters, this conviction is the Holy Spirit's job, not yours. It is not up to you and I to convict the world of their sin. But it is our job to show them their sin, to present the truth before them, the word of God, and let the Spirit use the word to convict them. That is our job. They may not agree with you. They may not like you. But the good news is, they cannot run from God's law because they're living in God's universe. If they create their own universe, maybe there'll be another way to get around that. As I'd like to say, even though I disdain the word, good luck with that. All right. They live in God's universe, which is governed by God's laws. Their, his word is written on their heart, and he has given them their conscience. They are constantly being reminded of God's truth. And it's our job to present that to them. <clears throat> Excuse me. No matter how open-minded an unbeliever may seem to be or they try to be, they really do believe that sin is bad, sick, perverted, and desperately evil. And if they say they don't, just ask them if you can punch them in the face. Okay? Okay? And just ask him, is this, is this just a my truth versus your truth, or is this a universal standard of truth? Okay, we can talk more about the specifics of that apologetic in the CE hour. Uh, that's not all of it. That's just a brief hook there. But think of it. You walk through the Ten Commandments with an unbeliever. They, you can come up with lots of excuses to justify your own lying, murderous thoughts, theft, adultery, etc. But have somebody do those things to you? <laughs> and that unbeliever is going to be very convinced of the rightness of God's law. So again, it's not our job to convict them. It's the Holy Spirit's. And he will do that. He convicts them of their sin. Secondly, he convicts them of their righteousness. Look also there in verse Nine, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. He is not convicting the world of his own righteousness. I think he's actually convicting the world of their righteousness here. And what they, can, what they need to see is that their righteousness is insufficient. 
uh, it's actually wicked. Okay, I already mentioned Paul in Romans 14, verse 23, whatever is not of faith is sin. Um, but Isaiah tells us, all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. Okay? And not to be indelicate, that's not a pretty picture of rags. Okay? Their righteousness is actually wicked. Think of it in Jesus' day. What did the Pharisees get angry of and accuse him of doing? He healed on the Sabbath. Ah, what a wicked man. Uh, he healed the lame man in chapter 5. He healed the blind man in chapter 9, both on the Sabbath. And they considered him wicked. What was their righteous keeping of the Sabbath? They refused to go into Pilate's house in order to condemn the sinless Son of God to death, all so that they could keep their law so as not to defile themselves. That's the world's righteousness versus God's. Their righteousness is insufficient. Same in our day. Uh, we say ridiculous things. Love is love. Doesn't matter. No, love is not love, not if it's up to the sinful man to define what love is. Okay? Follow your heart. It knows the way home. Sorry, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful and beyond cure. Who can know it? Our today's standard of righteousness is just as wicked as in Christ's day. And again, they're even inconsistent by their own standard. But the Spirit's job convicts sinners that their righteousness is inadequate. But finally, it convicts them of their judgment. It convicts them concerning their judgment. Verse 10 there says, Because the ruler of this world is judged. Okay? They judge the Son of God as wicked. They judge themselves to be righteous, and they judge themselves to be standing on the right side of history. They could not be more wrong in their judgment. And they're equally wrong in their judgments today. It says the prince of this world is judged. He stands condemned. Satan was finally and fully and completely defeated at the cross. He was assuredly defeated before that. It just hadn't happened in human history. And so, because of this, and because he is the father of lies, and he continues to lie to his followers this day, uh, their judgment is skewed and wrong. Our world is, is very quick to pronounce moral judgments, are they not? <clears throat> Excuse me. And yet... The standards by which they judge others um, are completely insufficient. If you live according to God's word, if you put it into practice and you proclaim it to a lost people, you'll probably be called something like hateful, racist, bigot, etc. You hold to these outdated, unloving beliefs. They could not be more wrong. So how should we respond? Pray that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of their judgments. They are judging incorrectly. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to make it known to them. Thus, the first reason that you must trust the Holy Spirit as you trust Jesus is that he comforts the church. The second reason is that he convicts transgressors and the third reason is that he completes the Trinity. He completes the Trinity. Now, by this, I do not mean that the Holy Spirit adds something that the other members of the Trinity were lacking, other than his person. But by definition, you can't have a try anything without three, right? The Trinity has always been there. It's always been active in the work of salvation. But in the Old Testament, they weren't all as clearly seen and understood. Okay, the, the 
writer of Proverbs tells us that God has a son, and we ought to know his name. Okay, we see in Genesis, in Judges, in Daniel, throughout the Old Testament, that there is an angel of Yahweh who takes the name and the prerogatives of Yahweh on himself. Okay, and we uh, are very, sometimes can be very impressed with our own vision as we're standing 2,000 years post the cross looking back, right? But this was not as clear to the Old Testament saints. Uh, and certainly there are references to the Spirit of God in creation and throughout uh, the work of the Old Testament, throughout the Scriptures. I already talked about the theocratic anointing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but knowing him as a distinct and separate person of the Godhead, not so clear in the Old Testament. So one reason that Jesus came was to reveal all of the persons of the Godhead more clearly than they had previously been known. And he completes the Trinity. He, the Holy Spirit, completes the Trinity in Revelation. Look at verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own, on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. All right? <laughs> Think about this with me. Jesus crammed John 13 through 17 all into this Thursday night conversation. It's probably going to take me two and a half months to preach through this. And I'm barely scratching the surface. There's a lot of information here. But you know what Jesus didn't reveal this night? Acts through Revelation. Could he have done it if he wanted to? Sure he could have. Um, could he have done it in a way that they understood it? Sure, he could have granted them that understanding. But he doesn't. The Holy Spirit is going to do that. Over time, through about a half a dozen authors or so, and over 70 years, the Holy Spirit is going to reveal the rest of God's Word. Now, have you ever stopped to consider the love of Jesus in this phrase here in verse 12? But you cannot bear them now. Jesus knew what the disciples could handle, and that's exactly what he gave them. No more, no less. What about you? Have you ever, are you better in a situation, in a better frame of mind? Is there ever a time where you're better able to understand things? Better able to hear the truth, etc.? Of course. Do you think the apostles were better able to understand these truths after the resurrection of Christ? Yes. They proved their inadequacy. They proved their, their lack of faith and their poor understanding before the resurrection. So think now of the greatest trial that God has brought to you in your lifetime. It may be years past. It may be recent. It may be present. Do you realize that God didn't give you that trial the moment you were born again? He knew that you could not bear it then. He's shaped you. He's strengthened you. He's building you up, preparing you for these difficult moments. And that's one of the reasons why he brought you the trial when he did. And now he is strengthening you again through the current trial that you're facing in order to prepare you for the next one. I remember going through a rough patch in college, and I, I sat down with my mentor in his office, and he was also my football coach, and I said, Coach, I just feel like I'm going through a, a storm right now. He said, well, take heart, David. There's only two types of people in the world, those who are going through a storm and those who are about to go through a storm. The Christian life is a storm, okay? And there may be moments where the wind blows a little less harsh, and you feel like you can stand firm and stand up straight. Other times you feel completely beaten down. And even opening up your eyes in the morning seems overwhelming. But know this, brothers and sisters. Jesus knows what you can bear. 
even if you and he have different assessments of what you can bear. He knows and he knows perfectly. The Father, Son, and Spirit are, prefer- are preparing you right now for the storm that you're in or the storm that you're going to face. And if you're in that storm right now, they have prepared you. Um, we often say some ridiculous things as Christians, unfortunately, if we don't stop and consider the context, right? We say, God will never give you more than you can bear. Hogwash. Of course he's going to give you more than you can bear. He's going to give you more that you can bear so that you look to him in faith and not to your own strength. What he promised is he'll never give you more temptation than you are able to bear. In every temptation, there is a way out. We do not have to sin, brothers and sisters. The way of escape is there. But he will regularly give you more than you can bear so that you look to him and see his sufficiency and see his strength. But take heart, brothers and sisters. If God is wise enough to pace out the revelation of Scripture over 70 years, can you trust him with all the details of your life? Be they 70 years or 27 The Holy Spirit completes the Trinity by completing the revelation. He also continues glorification. And I'm not here using this term in its salvific sense of our glorification. What I mean is that the Holy Spirit glorifies the Son the way the Son glorified the Father. You see that in verse 14. Jesus says, He, the Spirit, will glorify me, for He will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit is not concerned about his own humiliation. Nor was the Son. The Son was given a role of humiliation to take on human form, to glorify the Father. The Spirit is given a role of humiliation, not in human form, but to glorify the Son. And no one in the Trinity is concerned about it. Just because he takes a role of subordination does not mean he takes his person is subordinated. His deity is no more diminished than was the deity of the Son. Did Jesus humble himself? Yes. Will Jesus be glorified? Absolutely, yes. Does the Spirit humble himself? Yes. Will the Spirit be glorified? Absolutely, yes. What will that look like? I don't know. Spirit is ra- the Spirit. Scripture is rather quiet. We know what the exaltation of the Son will look like. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We know we have lots of pictures of what the kingdom of Christ will look like. What will the glorification of the Spirit look like? Specifically in the age to come, I don't know. In this age, he is the divine power in you and I to bring about our sanctification and glorification and to do the work of the ministry. This is why we took a week in the CE hour several months ago to review the Trinitarian creeds. Not because we look to creeds instead of Christ. Not because we look to creeds instead of Scripture. But because in these creeds, some of the smartest men in all of Christian history took months and sometimes years to hammer out a clear and orthodox articulation of the Trinity. And it hasn't been improved on in the last two millennia. Consider just a a paragraph here from the Athanasian Creed. Whoever will be saved before all things, it is necessary that he hold to the Catholic faith, Catholic with a little c, not a big c, which faith, except everyone do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish everlastingly. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, another of the Holy Spirit. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is all one, 
the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, the Holy Spirit incomprehensible. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Spirit eternal. Yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. As there are also not three uncreated, nor three incomprehensibles, but one uncreated, and one incomprehensible, and so on and so forth. The Holy Spirit is given to us to glorify Christ. Christ was given to us to glorify the Father. And by continuing this glorification, Father, Son, and Spirit, He reveals the Trinity to us. And thus, we find our joy in knowing our triune God. Thus, the first reason that you must trust the Holy Spirit as you trust Christ is that he comforts the church. The second reason is that he convicts transgressors. And the third reason is that he completes the Trinity. So how, how do you live this out? Well, one practical way, I suggest that you read the Athanasian Creed this afternoon and then sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. I am not joking. Your mother will benefit from this. But if you don't get to it today, then make time to do these things tomorrow. You need to think on the beauty and glory of our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Second, saturate your minds with the word. Fill your minds with the word. Read it when you get up. Read it throughout the day. Sing it. Have it running through your mind. Memorize it. We will talk about another way of doing this in the CE hour momentarily, but fill your minds with the testimony of the Spirit. That is the Scriptures. And then third, pray for the Spirit's convicting work in the world, in your children, in your neighbors, in your mother, if necessary, in your enemies, etc. The biggest problem in our world is not global warming, it's not politics, it's not income inequality, it's not even racism. The biggest problem in our world is a lack of knowing our God and knowing the gospel of his son. So let's spend our lives, our time, our treasure, our daily opportunities seeking to share the good news with those who have not yet repented. Let's pray. Father, your Holy Spirit is God. He is the, the one who works in our salvation to make us like Christ. He points us to Christ. He glorifies Christ. And he can be quenched. Father, let that not happen in our lives today. Help us to listen to the Spirit, to walk by the Spirit, and bear the fruit of the Spirit. For the glory of our triune God and for our joy in Him. God, thank you for the Holy Spirit and for His work in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For our closing song, take your hymn books. Turn to hymn number 316. Number 316, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. When you found it, if you're able, would you stand and sing all four verses with me?
Amen, amen. So much we could consider there, but think through that second verse as we before we go. Teach me to know that thou art always nigh. Teach me the struggles of the soul to bear, to check the rising doubt, the rebel sigh, and teach me the patience of unanswered prayer. Lots for you to chew on there. For our benediction, consider the words of Peter. We've been mulling over in the CE hour. 1 Peter 1, verse 2, he writes, To those who are elect exiles, chosen rejected ones, of the dispersion, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for the obedience to Jesus Christ, and for the sprinkling of his blood. You see the Trinitarian focus brought together there? May grace and peace be multiplied to you. So go in the grace and peace that is yours through the sanctification of the Spirit and show your children and the watching world the joyous life that is had by believing Jesus Christ. You are dismissed. Go in peace. Children, come, show me your pictures here. Thank you.